Hello, everyone. Welcome to the new edition of CEO and Market Expert Interviews. Today, I'm joined by Colin Haley. Colin is the new CEO of Premier American Uranium, Uranium company with assets in the United States. First of all, congratulations to your new appointment. Welcome to my show. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Colin, please tell us your background, your origin story. You are a new addition to the company. So I know some stuff about you, but I'm not sure that everybody knows. So what's your background, your origin story and start from scratch, please. Sure, I will do. Um, and so post-secondary, I wasn't sure exactly which direction I wanted to go uh, career-wise, but I had an interest in science and physics. Um, so I did a mechanical engineering diploma and I started working at a, a full service technical laboratory, uh, designing automated test programs for automotive and aerospace industry. Mm -hmm. um, but I was uh, working pretty closely with the chemistry lab, which was processing rock samples from mine sites and exploration, uh, drilling, uh, performing assays, et cetera. Um, and this was extremely interesting uh, to me. Um, and at the same time, I had a, a pretty keen interest in finance. So I was uh, completing a undergrad degree in commerce uh, in Toronto, um, focusing on finance and investments. And I did that spring, summer, fall, winter semesters, four nights a week. I did it part-time to, to make sure that I didn't have any student loans and I really liked what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I had the flexibility to continue. So um, as I worked uh, more in the laboratory, I start, I became quality manager. So I was doing a lot of, um, of the tracking and calibration and work on the uh, analytical equipment that was used to do, perform assay work, spectrometry spectrometry, uh, et cetera. So um, I was getting a pretty intimate understanding of, of how uh, the QC worked for analyzing mining samples and, and core and how, how they were processed in the lab, which is um, very interesting to me. And then um, as I was finishing my commerce degree, I wanted to continue to do something to differentiate myself. So I went into, I, I got admitted to an MBA program. I started working on that. I also did that uh, part-time while working at the laboratory and advancing my understanding of, uh, of mineral analysis and processing. And um, towards the end of the MBA program, uh, I got recruited by a big Canadian bank to uh, start structuring uh, commercial loans uh, for business. Um, and that would have been my first move into finance and it was a good opportunity. Um, so I took it. I, I left the uh, technical industry then. And uh, while I was working in that job, I had a much, uh, I had a much keener interest for the capital markets. Yeah. So um, I was working in Vancouver and a broker dealer out of Vancouver, Haywood securities um, with a fantastic reputation yes. for, uh, for its sell side research is specifically in the resource sector. Um, an opportunity came up. This was about 2008 and uranium was just becoming interesting. And they had just hired a brilliant geologist by the name of Jordy Mark, who was going to be covering uranium. And I didn't know anything about uranium at the time. I, I, so I, I, I left, I left the bank. I came over to, and I started working as an associate. And at the time we didn't cover, um, anything. Uh, and we were just ramping up coverage in the uranium space. So he was doing a lot of site visits, um, you know, your Anerts, your energy, Bannerman, all, all over the world, Africa, Australia, uh, Canada, the United States. And I was back at the office modeling and learning these pro projects and, you know, learning their process flow sheets and, and starting to model them out. And I was getting a good understanding of how they how they processed minerals, um, various production types, ISR, conventional, um, different flow sheets, and all these things that, that were important, important as I was learning. And uh, then about 2012, uh, Jordy left the company to go to a hedge fund, and I got the promotion to analyst. So this was a really interesting time to be an analyst. Um, we were just, Fukushima had just happened about 12 months earlier, and we were still in that period where we weren't sure how quickly Japanese restarts were going to yeah. happen. Yeah. It wasn't clear that it was going to be as protracted as it ended up being. Um, at the same time I was covering, we were covering the bulk. So iron ore and coal were part of our coverage space. Um, but, you know, it was a, it was a pretty tough, uh, 
tough grind after that in, in the uranium space. But I had learned so much about the uranium space that I was pretty, pretty convinced on the thesis. Um, it was one of the more interesting demand sides to analyze because, you know, with only one real major commercial use, um, the, the demand side was not not necessarily easy, but really interesting to wrap your, your wrap your head around. You had amazing visibility on how long it took to build mines and, and or sorry to uh, build reactors and 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 you know the processes that they went through to, and which jurisdictions were building them quickly. China obviously um, was was at the beginning of a of a really aggressive ramp up of its uh, react um, nuclear power capacity. Um, so. That was that was kind of the the origin story. Since then, I've been working on on projects and visiting projects uh, in the uranium space all over the world, um, and you know, really focused on analyzing them. And I've had a lot of exposure being a sell side analyst to how how these companies um, evolve, how the, how they what drives value, um, and and how to, how to move projects forward to to try to get recognition in the market for those projects. Yeah, you said what draws value. Tell us what draws that. What draws the value exactly? Well, I think you know specifically for Premier American, um, what's going to draw value is us leveraging our technical team and our capital, our capital markets access, and our and our the intellectual capital we have internally access to that that has an unbelievable track record of capital allocation to go out and find projects that are premium in their jurisdictions, not necessarily getting recognition for, for the value that they should get. And, you know, with our technical team having vast experience in the premium jurisdictions in the US, we we're able to find those projects. And, you know, one of the three pillars that the company is built on, um, acquisition, exploration, and development, we're out looking to acquire projects that have a relatively smooth path through exploration and development um, to try to extract value, extract value. So de-risking is going to be key to extracting value, proving up um, historic resources quickly, um, generating news flow around those, and then positioning the portfolio um, to potentially fill su supply gaps in the future, looking for projects that can actually represent future production. I think the, the, that's the way to extract value. Acquire inexpensively, expose the value through through systematic exploration and development, and, and then position them for as real candidates for future production. Yeah, that is a real good uh, approach. I agree on that. Uh, what is the future role for Tim? You become a new CEO. Uh, Tim will have a new role. What, what kind of? Tim's going to be chairman, and I'm really looking forward to have access to the the mentorship of of Tim and the rest of the team. Uh, you know, the team's DNA is extremely um, strong, and and they have a an amazing track record of creating companies, creating value within those companies, and and uh, developing assets within them, and and creating value for shareholders specifically. So as chairman, I'll have access to, to Tim, his mentorship, you know, will communicate on strategy and as, as well as the rest of the, the team that has tentacles all, all through some of the best uh, uranium companies. Okay, so Tim will actively be involved in the future developments for the company just, just in another role. Okay. For, for sure. Yeah. Uh, what's your take on the current uranium market? Where are we now? Where are we going next? What's your take? I think I think after the consolidation that we've had in, in spot uranium prices, we're we're quickly returning to a, a rebuilding phase here. Yeah. Um, before, as an analyst in the space, you know, I had my own supply demand models, mm -hmm. and I was forecasting triple digit uranium prices for at least the next three years, most likely longer. What underpins that mainly is that production specifically is it. Is, is quite hard and ramp up ramping up a production is also difficult uh, on top of so we've got you know the major producers working on ramp up schedules that you know i'm very unconcerned that they're going to overproduce 
I think the risk the, is to the is to the underproduction scenario, and that will only exacerbate um, kind of the uranium supply shortfall that we have. Um, but I'm looking for triple digit prices at least for the next three years, um, or at least you know that was my published estimates, and um, I think that it's probably going to be higher for longer. I think that um, you know as as we move through 2024, the world's largest producer probably sometime in August is going to tell us more about what the production potential is for 2025. I think in September of 2023, the last time we heard a, a, a real update from, from that group was, you know, hundred percent of subsoil lease agreements. Yeah. I don't think that, I don't think that they're going to be anywhere near that in 2025. I think most people don't at this point, but, you know, just to put numbers on it, um, I think midpoint of guidance, 2024, 56 million pounds, 100% of subsoil lease agreements was over 80. Yeah. That would be a 24 million pound ramp up. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the best year that they ever had in, in recent memory was about 2009. I think they did over 14 million pounds year over year in production increase. But, you know, that takes a real specific investment strategy prior to ramp up. And so, you know, th that, that production source is probably going to be double digit millions of pounds lower than some people may still think for 2025 that's going to exacerbate the supply deficit for sure um and then you know other major producers uh even if they hit their numbers it doesn't fully address the um supply deficit um at least not in 2025 2026 yeah and then uh you know some of the fantastic uh deposits of the athabasca basin that are you know potentially on schedule to come into production in 2028 2029 I mean, through no fault of anyone's, this is an extremely technical and and complex process of not only permitting, but also constructing and yeah. optimizing those operations. So the, to me, the chances of a short of, of a supply profile with a negative bias are, are pretty high. And, and for that reason, we at Premier are focusing on U.S. assets that we think can, you know, we think that prices are going to remain at that higher level in the in the higher marginal cost incentive range um, to to incentivize the smaller U.S. high enough to incentivize the smaller U.S. producers to continue to produce and, and do so profitably. And you know, with with several more than more than four more you know several U.S. uranium companies looking to transition to production in the next eighteen months. I think that they're starting to prove out our thesis and that's where we're going to find value in our projects is, is showing that our projects can be advanced and be part of that, that pipeline of, of U S projects that can fill the supply gaps. Yeah, definitely spot on with that. Uh, I agree 100%. Uh, Colin, what's your take on uranium equities performance at the moment? Uh, do they need to do some catch up, catching up or do you believe that they're fair valued at this moment? What's your take on that? I personally think that there that there's substantial room to catch up. I mean, I I, I was looking at um, you know, in in the research that that I was publishing, I was looking at the valuations even from April twenty April twenty twenty two. Uranium prices were hitting sixty three seventy five. Outside of the producers and near term producers, and and maybe next gen and Denison. Mm -hmm. On average, the explorers and developers are trading at double digit percentages below where they were trading when yeah. uranium was 6375. And, uh, you know, th there was there is a correction for sure in those names year to date 2024. They're, they're doing decent. But I think there's a, a huge, a, a very large gap to fill between what what uranium stocks are worth if, if $100 uranium is the reality and where they're sitting right now. Um, one of the last things I did as a research analyst was um, an updated demand supply deck. And, you know, according to the models that I was responsible for, uranium stocks were discounting 60 to $65 uranium, um, meaning I was reaching current share prices by applying 60 to $65 uranium in my model. You know, we're, we're substantially higher than that. I personally think that we're going to be substantially higher than that for the next at least three years. And, and so I think that over time, as prices stay higher for longer, uranium equities start to um, reflect that reality. 
and, and I, sorry. Yeah, you believe that is the case for both uh, developers and uh, juniors. I mean, explorers. I, I think there's a there's a more of an undervaluation undervaluation and under recognition in the uh, less advanced stage assets, yes. which is you know Premier's focus is obviously acquisition, exploration, development. So we're trying to create that pipe or you know identify assets that can fill that pipeline and then be graduated up that de-risking scale and and capture some of that higher valuation for sure um valuations for the the tier one producers and the companies that are demonstrating the potential to be in production next 12 to 18 months those valuations are definitely um a premium but a substantial premium probably an i won't say undeserved they're a premium to exploration and development not a premium to where i think they should be but I do think that in the development and exploration phases, those assets are, are going to be worth a lot more yeah. as we see higher prices for longer and as we see production, the supply gap not being filled by new production. Yes, yes. Uh, tell me more about the acquisition of American Future Fuel. Uh, that is also from recent uh, news the same news where you you were announced as a new CEO. Can you share me some details and plans for the future with this? And what are the benefits for both sides of this transaction? For sure. So um, American Future Fuel, the primary asset that, that they have, Sebiera in New Mexico, is a kind of brownfields, um, historic producing uh uranium project that uh, that has about 19 million pounds in inferred resources at about 0.17%. Uh, That's a historic resource, not a current inferred resource. Um, it really fits the premier uranium strategy of acquisition, develop and explore because we believe that, and, and what American Future Fuel is already showing is that they've gone and done some, some confirmation drilling to start to prove up the da database that underpins that historic inferred resource. And they're seeing very, very good reconciliation between drill re results that they're getting and the historic resource. So we think that with some more drilling, we can quickly start to de-risk that inferred historic resource, get it current. And then the St. Anthony deposit to the south, um, it had a historic, historical internal resource um, calculated on it of about 8 million pounds, um, lower grades um, than, than the main Sebieta deposit, but there, there may be a higher grade component to that. And we're looking at the potential that that, is, that St. Anthony deposit is connected to the Sebieta deposit, which means, you know, we're starting to get that critical mass required um, to, to start to look at, um, you know, the potential economics of an asset like that. So that was really the the crown jewel of American Future Fuel that that we want to wrap in, and it really fits our strategy of of acquisition. But with the potential, it, since we believe it's one of the, it's the probably the best project in New Mexico, um, it, it fits our thesis of you know unlocking value through de-risking, um, you know, exploration and development to to really show that. It, it's worth more than than we're paying with, with with by putting some work in. Yeah, and in my experience, usually historic uh, resources tend to be much bigger when they are in uh, upgraded to NI compliant resources. Definitely. So, I know we have to always take that with a grain of salt when we have a historic uh, resource, but it tells you that there is something over there that is for sure. You can take that. Uh, okay, the, can you give me an uh, update on Wyoming and Colorado projects? Is there any news, anything new happening over there? Sure. So the Cyclone deposit in the Great Divide Basin is a is a project that um, is is extremely important to Premier. Uh, it has a it, it had some drilling um, about eighty holes uh, prior that we that were followed up with a radiometric survey in twenty twenty two. And then in 2023, there was a technical report, an initial 43-101 report done on the project that outlined an exploration target of eight to 12, eight to 12 and a half million pounds, round numbers, um, at 0.06% grade. 
you know, um, 0.06% U308. The uh, Your Energies project in the region um, works quite effectively. I think they've mined almost 3 million pounds to 2023 um, um, by ISR at mining 0.049%. So we we really like the potential of that project to be to, to evolve into something that could fit into a pipeline for any number of the Wyoming ISR processing plants, or even potentially uh, self-sustaining. And you know that exploration target um, really only pertains to the holes that were previously drilled on that project. So there's there's uh, plenty of uh, exploration upside um, as well. And uh, we will be we're working on drill permitting for that project right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will be drilling it in, um, probably in the middle of 2024. So we should start to be able to um, show that we are in the process of delineating a resource there that, that hopefully falls within the parameters of that uh, resource target. So um, the idea there is to, you know, explore and develop and, and uh, really show the value and scale of, of that project. Um, you know, and it's, it's an incredible jurisdiction where, you know, M multiple ISR facilities have su successfully started up yeah. since I've yeah. since I've been in analyst in Wyoming. So um, we really like the uh, the prospects there. And on the in in the Irvine Mineral Belt, the Colorado projects, um, you know, past producing assets that uh, have great exploration potential. Um, we're still in the process of defining what the drill program should look like there. So we haven't moved. Um, so. The, the, we'll probably be generating news um, from New Mexico and from uh, Wyoming, mostly in 2024, but we will be working on the uh, uh, Monogram Mesa and Atkinson Mesa projects in, in uh, Colorado to uh, really study what the best strategy for advancement there will be. I'm sure drilling will be involved at some point, but we have some data to crush and, uh, and some, uh, and, and, and just to figure out what the, the optimized strategy should be there and what the budget should be. Okay, so the news flow from all three projects, uh, all three jurisdictions will 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 be coming this year uh, ab about uh, activities over there. Uh, you mentioned jurisdictions. I, I, I would like to touch a bit on that. So you're present in, uh, in three uh, jurisdictions, Wyoming, New Mexico, and Colorado. Are you comfortable with all three jurisdictions? I mean, they are a bit different. Let's say in New Mexico, when it comes to exploration and drilling, it's a it's a little bit different story than Wyoming, for it, for example. Can you tell me more about all three jurisdictions that you are operating in? For sure. So, well, New Mexico specifically, and one of the one of the attractive uh, attributes of the Sabieta project is the fact that it's on on private lands. And um, through through the land grant, and and this will should be a much easier um, regime to permit under than than maybe some of the other options within New Mexico. So it has an attractive uh, it, it has an attractive potential permitting um, stream relative to some of the other projects there. Wyoming has an agreement state. You know, it it has a, a, a very um, well defined uh, permitting process that's outside of the the nrc it's all handled at the state level so quite uh quite an attractive jurisdiction to be in from a permitting perspective and colorado um as well where you know we we have to look at the projects in colorado and, and look at the, the strategy for for permitting there but yeah all you know new mexico has a history of producing over 350 million pounds so it's quietly the fourth largest uh uranium ju jurisdiction in the world um, based on historic production, and uh, you know, from from each of combined Colorado, New Mexico, and Wyoming, I think have produced almost 650 million pounds. So these are these are the premium jurisdictions of the United States, and uh, you know that's why what we're focused on. We're we're acquiring projects that we think can we could be a, can be advanced and not run into major permitting hurdles that end up becoming binary. Okay. Uh, can we expect more M&A for the company? And I want to hear your take on a general M&A on the uranium market. Are we going to see more M&A activities in the next period? Um, I, I definitely think that we should generally in, in the uranium space, specifically from pre Premier American Uranium, for sure. We're going to okay. be aggressive. You know, we 
because we have a, a technical team in place in, in the U.S. that has an unbelievable amount of experience looking at almost every project, um, you know, we're, we're already prioritizing um, acquisition targets um, that complement our portfolio. One of the keys to building a portfolio of uranium assets is, is that, you know, we don't want, we want to limit the, the patchwork of, of uranium assets um, as much as possible. We really want to add projects that have synergy with each other. Yeah. Um, it's probably an overused word, but you can definitely add projects and land that could potentially help consolidate a region or an area more so than just, you know, adding pounds in, in a, a widespread locations to position ourselves as, as a, as a, mineral bank you know we want to be both we want to have large large resources but also in in situations where there's complementary uh or you know synergy between between the assets so we're going to be very active on the on the m a front i believe as long as it makes sense to do so um mm -hmm. as long as we think we we can pick up projects and de-risk and extract value from them um th then we'll be doing that for sure um as far as m a in broader more broadly in uranium, I think that uh, we definitely should. I think there's some even uh, even larger scale stuff that that should be consolidated um, into in, in, into certain vehicles. Um, there's some very very attractive projects out there that um, make sense um, in the hands of. Mind them. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I I do believe that as long as we have high uranium prices, um, there's going to be. Uh, Companies trying to backfill pipelines um, with, with solid projects that complement their assets. Really, the same strategy that we have. We're just trying to leverage our technical team and capital allocation skills to be first, get the yeah. best assets, avoid the assets that don't make sense, and um, hopefully unlock some value. Yeah, but when it comes to Premier, you will stay focused on on the uh, United States, or is there an option that you expand your view on maybe on some other jurisdictions? For, for now, it's a U.S. focus, um, and and that has to do with kind of our core competencies, our technical expertise, and our belief that the United States has some additional catalysts outside of the general uranium space. You know, the United States, among 21 other countries, committed to triple nuclear or um, nuclear energy capacity by 2030. Um, they, you know, they're, they're, they committed along with three or four other countries to uh, spend about 4.2 billion to uh, secure a supply chain that's free of Russian influence. There's a there's a big push in the United States for nuclear energy leadership, energy independence, um, and all of these things to me, really suggests that there's a potential for um, favorable permitting regimes um, and, and incentives to, outside of just the uranium price to potentially develop mines there. So we see it as a really friendly, favorable jurisdiction that is in the middle of an unprecedented push to advance this sector specifically. So for now, it's a, it's a US focus. Okay, you have a very interesting share registry. For the ones who don't, does not know that, please expand a little bit on that. Who is in your share registry? And there are some bigger names over there. Share share it, please. Yeah, so we um, pro forma, assuming we we yes. um, get this deal done with um, with American Future Fuel, uh, Seachin Cove. Uh, when you mentioned Tim Rotolo, uh, he's the founder of Seachin Cove. Sachem Cove owns 40%, will own 40% of the pro forma company. Um, so a very strong shareholder, very strategic, very um, uranium focused. Uh, ISO uh, pro forma is going to own 9%. So ISO energy, obviously, uh, Premier American was spun out of consolidated uranium right before it merged with, with ISO energy. So yeah, th those guys are very committed shareholders. Um, we, you know, I expect that they're going to be very supportive. Uh, Mega Uranium uh, it has a had a fantastic history of of executing a consolidation model in the industry to generate value for shareholders, just like Consolidated Uranium did. Um, so, and with uh, with American Future Fuel, uh, Encore is going to own four percent of the Proforma stock. Um, 
I've spoken to them. They seem um, very happy, uh, but overall, that 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 leaves us with about forty nine percent under under those bonnets that are very friendly shareholders understand the uranium space, aren't in it for the trade. So I'm um, I'm very excited to have those those shareholders and uh, and and to be able to rely on on that those groups. Yeah. That is a great share registry considering your market cap. Uh, not every company can say that it has that kind of names uh, on their share registry. I agree. Uh, you, we already touched at the beginning of the interview about uh, access to capital for, for, for your company. So you don't see any problem with raising funds in the future for your company developments. You got that part, let's say, covered. Well, it's extremely hard to uh, speak for you know the of shareholders, course. but we, we we intend to do everything strategically to to the best um, practices that I've seen for generating value as an analyst for sixteen years. I really have generated an idea of what how, what I think should happen to extract and demonstrate the maximum value for your assets. And we expect, we hope to be able to raise future capital on on the back of our successes um, and demonstrate that we deserve that money. So uh, I wouldn't say that um, we I'm taking anything for granted. Um, I expect those sh those shareholders are all um, extremely careful with their capital, and we're going to do on the premier side what we think it takes to deserve their future participation. Um, that said, I do think that having a strong shareholder base um, helps. It is, is is extremely advantageous when it comes to uh, raising money, which you know we pro forma we're going to have eleven million dollars. We we're probably going to put about two million dollars into Cyclone this year once we completely uh, have the American Future Fuel acquisition behind us. Then we'll we'll figure out the budget for 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 that uh for the new mexico assets but um you know we hope to be raising money on the back of events that deserve additional capital okay um, but for now you are covered yeah okay got it final question Colin. uh news flow what and when can we expect news flow from from the company so for, for sure, um, in May, we're, we're hoping to be closing the acquisition of American Future Fuel. Um, at, at the same time, we're working on drill, pit, drill permits for Wyoming. So in the middle of the year, we should start to um, we should start drilling, hopefully in Wyoming, and start to generate some new flow uh, related to the Cyclone project. Um, New Mexico, they'll be drilling there as well. So we'll be generating news there. And then the other piece is the potential of additional acquisitions. So we've got, you know, exploration result potential as well as M&A potentials for news flow.